And muchas gracias para todos por venir uh, esta tarde. And that's the end of my Spanish. <laughs> so, um, as a faculty member now, I have to give the full disclosure of my different roles and um, activities. And um, it's actually kind of interesting in and of itself because um, this is a brand new internet company, Cupid.me, which is uh, creating apps and is launching a new way for people to communicate their STD test results. Um, ISIS is one of the oldest um, internet-based and um, SMS based companies um, to do sexual health services and has worked in Peru, has worked uh, over the world. AIDS Project Los Angeles is one of the largest um, AIDS service organizations in Los Angeles providing AIDS uh, um, support and advocacy and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the WHO congenital syphilis um, elimination in, um, initiative. But to be, I think to be, to be successful and relevant um, in, in this field, and that'll be one of my uh, conclusions, it's really important to be a good collaborator and to work with lots of different organizations to seek a lot of different um, funding sources because you know approaching sexual health uh, is complicated and does take a, um, a variety of responses. So I was going to try to limit uh, my talk today to these four infectious di diseases, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and HIV infection. And then I'm going to share with you some new things in terms of HIV infection that just came out yesterday. So this will be as um, up to date as possible. Um, I always like to start with this image of urethral discharge that we saw at San Francisco City Clinic several years ago. Um, as in, in this one image, it, it captures um, a lot of issues about human sexuality, uh, but, but, but some also about the consequences of human sexuality, um, and people can get STDs, and it's a normal consequence of uh, being sexually active. Um, I'm going to jump right into um, what we've been doing with molecular-based nucleic acid amplification tests as an um, as a infectious disease specialist. I'm particularly interested in the role of the laboratory and what the laboratory can do to support our efforts for prevention and control of infectious diseases. So early on, we had um, reported and identified that these nucleic acid amplification tests were much more sensitive, so they could more accurately detect infection in specific anatomic sites versus the conventional methods of culture. So in, in this one study, you can see that the LCR, which is a older type of uh, nucleic acid amplification test or PCR kind of assay was about twice as sensitive as culture. That enabled us to go out to San Francisco, look at the positivity, and you can see about one out of 12 men who have sex with men in San Francisco carried gonorrhea in the throat. And uh, this was the first kind of report of this high frequency of gunnery in the throat that made us think about transmission dynamics, about um, emergence of resistance, and the role of these throat in, um, infections in perpetuating the uh, spread of gonorrhea. We, we also went on to uh, demonstrate the improved sensitivity of the assay uh, in rectal specimens. And you can see that, uh, you know, compared to culture, the nucleic acid amplification tests are more than twice as sensitive. And then importantly, we're going to show that um, people could do self-collection. And as we think about moving our diagnostics and screenings from clinics <coughs> to mobile vans, um, I was hearing this morning about the Via Libre's uh, mobile van program. We want to potentially even shift that out further to you know, put these diagnostics and screening tools in the hands of the people. And uh, it's about empowerment of people to take charge of their sexual health. And when I get to HIV, I'll talk uh, <coughs> some more about uh, um, innovations in that area. But one of the um, abilities of these molecular assays and people's um, capability to collect their own tests is there's now internet-based programs in the United States where people can go online, request their tests. The tests can be mailed to them. They can collect the specimens in the privacy of their own home mail them back and find out their test result and then get treated on the basis of that test result. So the internet and demonstration that people can self-collect has been a great um, advantage to improvements in uh, sexual health. And similarly, we're able to take the tools out into the community, 
and then people collect their own specimens and do kind of widespread <coughs> uh, screening. This is uh, one of the fairs in San Francisco where we did self-collection. And then from, from these kind of studies and outreach, you can see a variety of, uh, of positivity, anywhere from 5 to about 11 percent. Um, I think from our CPOS study here, the rectal gonorrhea positivity was about 4 percent. And for rectal chlamydia infection, um, which I'll cover also, um, is about 12 percent. And that may be because rectal gonorrhea can be more symptomatic, so people may seek screening a little bit earlier, whereas rectal chlamydia um, can just harbor as an asymptomatic infection. And then more, more, more recently, and this hasn't been something that's been utilized widespread in terms of public health programs yet, is that we're able to demonstrate um, that um, men could also collect a pharyngeal specimen themselves as well as a clinician could. So there was a concordance of over 95 percent, a high, uh, high capital value was translates into um, very good and acceptability what, what, what was high. So this, able, this offers us another valid opportunity to um, enable people to screen themselves for pharyngeal infections. And um, we had done different projects where we put the screening tools out in the community and had people collect the tools from different venues and then collect their own specimens and send them in for uh, testing, and this is something that could certainly be explored here uh, as well. And then as a result of these um, experiments and these studies, the, both CDC and the WHO, the WHO guideline is, is relatively new, uh, it's ends the first for looking at STD treatment and, pre and prevention in MSM and transgender people, recognize the value of, of these molecular assays, of the um, specimen of the innovations in specimen collection and now increasingly we see around the world that um, people that clinical sites programs that are trying to address sexual health are including these types of uh, assays but really the big news and what's new in gonorrhea is the issue of antimicrobial resistance so this shows uh, across the, the, the United States, the uh, frequency of increased resistance of gonorrhea to the drug called cefixime. So cefixime is actually used here, it's available here in Peru, it's similar in terms of its spectrum to a drug called ceftriaxone. It's our last consistently effective drug against gonorrhea. And you can see, uh, particularly in men who have sex with men, the frequency of resistance has gone from almost 0% to about 5%, also gone up in California, less so in other parts of the United States or in other populations, but California and MSM have traditionally been kind of the canaries or the first populations to demonstrate resistance to antibiotics. So, th so this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in February 2012, and the, uh, Dr. Bolin, who was my former Supervisor is now the director of the CDC STD program. She decided it's time to sound the alarm. So now the alarm, the world alarm, has been sounded. And when the alarm is sounded, it's get picked up by other other media outlets such as uh, Culture and Leisure section of Ynet News and Wired magazine. So it actually creates awareness um, in a variety of different venues and uh, WHO comes on board and says that this is a global health threat and the organism has become a, a super bug and we had a meeting yesterday with the US Navy and even the US Navy has recognized the threat of the super bug and they told us they had orders from Washington to increase their surveillance and increase their capacity to address uh, th this organism. Now we've been working with this organism public health issues around it for 15, 20 years. We're excited finally to see NAMRU um, become interested in it as well. So now uh, gonorrhea treatment has evolved from uh, one drug to, to two drugs. And this is the first time in 75 years that now we have to start thinking about gonorrhea treatment like TB, where we have to treat with four drugs or two drugs in the consolidation phase, or like HIV, where we have to treat with at least three drugs. So now gonorrhea has become one of those germs that we need multi-drug therapy. 
and that's a huge change, um, at least in the United States, because we have to use an injection, and we have to use a second drug. It makes treatment more complicated. It, comp it makes things that um, Jesse Clark does more complicated with partner therapies. We can't necessarily deliver an injection the same way as we can pills. Um, and it's certainly a step backwards in terms of our ability to treat and control gonorrhea. And what the CDC does is part of its surveillance, it, it tracks from 1988 till 2011 the types of drugs that are used to treat gonorrhea. And you can see now it's predominantly ceftraxone, which is this white and, and green. And it went from oral drugs by mouth to um, injectable drugs. And um, with, with that shift, we, we, we can monitor how drug use has changed. So the conventional response to drug resistance has been more newer drugs. So our infectious disease colleagues who lobby Congress and people who live around Washington and go, we need more drugs, we need newer drugs, we need special you know, programs for pharmaceutical and drug development. That's been the history of response to an um, bacterial drug resistance and generally it's been successful. So we've always been able to have new drugs, something newer, better, uh, that will tackle the organism, but we're running out of options and we're running out of enthusiasm. Uh, more condom use, so the CDC says, well, if we could reduce gonorrhea by more condom use, we won't need, you know, to work out as much. Fewer partners, so traditional STD control um, response is more condom use, fewer partners, more treatment adherence by doctors, use the right medicine, follow the guidelines, more vigilance for failure. So th this is the, what the conventional response is. And then also more, more monitoring, so we need better surveillance. Now none of these in themselves have ever proven to reduce resistance, or even in combination have uh, been proven to reduce resistance. So what we really need is, is actually more ideas. And this is a new idea that I've been uh, developing. It's not necessarily um, innovative for infectious disease treatment, but it is for gonorrhea. Oh, there we go. All right. So when I looked at the distribution of resistance in gonorrhea, about 70% of the isolates in the United States are susceptible to everything. And, you know, really many are susceptible to certain other drugs, and only about 10% are truly resistant to the fluoroquinolones. So the quinolones is this, these three essentially, so maybe about 10 to 15 percent are resistant to the quinolones, which is like a drug like Cipro. So Cipro was used here widely for treatment of gonorrhea. 10 to 15 percent is resistant to Cipro, but that means that 85 percent are susceptible to Cipro. So if we could use Cipro to treat based on susceptibility data, we might have a better shot at reducing the continued emergence of resistance. And this shows in San Francisco, we move from um, about in 2000, we recognized this increase in resistance to Cipro. We stopped using Cipro, and then you can see the frequency of Cipro's phosphorus and re re resistance came down tremendously. So it's somewhat surprising, our drug use in STD clinics may have had an impact on the ecology of the organism in the, uh, in the larger population. And this has actually been shown with other germs like streptococcus and erythromycin use in uh, Finland. So based on uh, some of those ideas, we, we, we have begun to develop a new molecular test where we could identify a gene change in the ciprofloxacin target to um, develop a molecular marker for resistance. Remember, much diagnosis now of things like gonorrhea and chlamydia are done by these molecular tests. So we don't have culture, we don't have organisms. So we need new molecular tests and new ways to think and measure resistance. So with my colleagues at the San Francisco Department of Public Health Laboratory, and with Mark Seidner, who was a uh, UCSF medical student who came down here for actually a year, um, we developed a test that was able to differentiate between resistant and non-resistant ciprofloxacin um, susceptible gonorrhea. And then when we compared that test versus the, the conventional 
means of susceptibility testing, we can see that this PCR test was very good and actually was 100% accurate at detecting susceptible infection and about 90% accurate at detecting resistance. So if the PCR test said susceptible, it was going to be susceptible. However, we never really rolled that out and moved that clinically. And I was thinking about this last year, and I said, well, why don't we use this clinically? And why don't we attach this to the usual mechanism and see if we can uh, change the way we treat gonorrhea? So right now, there, there, there's an uh, instrument made by a manufacturer called Cephid, which we use for TB, which is used increasingly for TB diagnosis, which will tell you, you have TB, yes or no, and is it resistant, yes or no? They also have that for Staph aureus. It tells you if it's methicillin resistant, Staph aureus, yes or no. So the idea is, uh, can we develop the same thing for gonorrhea, and then um, detect the organism, detect resistance, and then tell the provider or the clinician you have a resistant organism or not. We can reduce the use of these third generation cephalosporins like cefixime or ceftriaxone, and then we can potentially decrease the emergence of resistance. So um, look for the outcomes of this study next year, and I'll let you know if it worked. So that's uh, what kind of what's new from my perspective in gonorrhea. For chlamydia, um, similar story at some level for the molecular-based nucleic acid amplification tests. Again, the tests are much more sensitive than culture, and really culture what was a no-go for public health. I mean, culture require, of chlamydia requires a tissue system. It requires correct collection and transport of the specimen. And we weren't making diagnoses of chlamydia with these culture methods. So the advent of um, amplification testing really opened the door for widespread chlamydia screening and uh, treatment. We learned that much of rectal chlamydia in men is asymptomatic. So about 86% of people who have rectal chlamydia have it and don't know it, which also means they can spread it and not know it. And when we did our studies across the population in San Francisco, we found that about 1 out of 12 people carried rectal chlamydia. Here again in the CPOS study it was about 1 out of 8, about 12% had rectal chlamydia infection. So these infections are, are common. People have them and they don't know it. They, they can spread them. And then importantly, um, we've been able to show that these rectal infections with gonorrhea and chlamydia increase the risk for HIV acquisition. So if someone has a rectal infection, that infection can change the environment in the rectum, can bring in different immune cells, and if someone's exposed to HIV, they're five or six times more likely to become HIV infected than if they did not have um, these co-infections. Part of our work has also looked at uh, lymphogranuloma venerium, which is a type of chlamydia infection. So chlamydia trachoma this causes three kinds of diseases. It causes eye disease, trachoma, it causes genital disease, and it causes lymphogranuloma venerium, which is also a genital disease, but often more serious and associated with proctitis and lymphadenopathy. There were outbreaks in Europe associated with hepatitis C, and we didn't know what was going on in the United States. So again, based on the molecular characteristics of a um, outer membrane protein of the organism called PMP, um, you can see that the uh, that the sequences are somewhat different, that these A through C, which causes eye disease or trachoma, is different than the D through Ks, which cause genital disease, is different than the L cerevars, which cause lymphogranuloma venerium. So we could develop a PCR test to look specifically for L type, and then use that epidemiologically. And we found by going back to stored specimens that there was a steady rate of about 5% rectal chlamydia LGV type in San Francisco, and then we applied this to specimens we had in Peru from the CPOL study and found that none of those 86 positive chlamydia isolates um, were positive. So we could say it's kind of low level endemic in San Francisco, but not epidemic and not changing in frequency, and we didn't see any um, in Peru. But this study actually looked mostly at uh, urine isolates um, and not rectal isolates. We've never actually repeated it in rectal isolates. So that would be a study that we could certainly do. And we have the uh, technology and we have the uh, capacity to look for that uh, in Peru, in rectal specimens. 
by looking at these rectal specimens, we're able to um, look at clinical findings and find out that people with L-type L or LGV-type were seven times more likely to be symptomatic than non-symptomatic. However, much was still in asymptomatic people and it has policy implications in terms of treatment. In California, we treat all rectal chlamydia, as you probably do here, similarly, with one gram of azithro or a week of doxy. The CDC, though, recommends three weeks if you think you have LGV type, but there's no diagnostic test for LGV that's readily available, so it's a little bit tricky to make that LGV diagnosis. And then uh, very recently, and this was just uh, submitted by Gene Cabeza two days ago, um, we embarked uh, as part of her SAFR uh, experience a screening treatment program in pregnant women in Lima. So right now, not in not in any country in Latin America and not really in any low and middle income country do they routinely screen women for chlamydia infection. Chlamydia infection in pregnancy has been shown by observational studies to be associated with miscarriage, fetal loss, um, preterm labor, low birth weight, infant, uh, low birth weight uh, babies, uh, pneumonia in infants, and conjunctivitis in infants, so serious outcomes. However, um, no one is screening. So we want to say, okay, well, what is the prevalence in women, pregnant women here in Lima? And is it feasible to screen them, to treat them? And will, will they do a self-collected vaginal swab? So that, that was another big question. Because we're, we're having pregnant women do self-collected vaginal swabs. And there's a concern, okay, is it going to be damaging um, to the uh, baby? Is the provider not going to find it acceptable? There she is, Jean. I'm talking about your great work here. Thank you. So um, in a very short time, through tremendous effort that Jean did, she was able to enroll 603 women in uh, almost a little under three, three months, really two months as the holidays, and found that 10% were chlamydia positive. And the uh, UPCH lab here provided a uh, tremendous um, asset to be able to do the, the test and turn them in around in a reasonable time so we can use them clinically. We were able to treat 90% of women to date and a very high proportion of partners treated. So this tells us that the prevalence is high, testing is acceptable, treatment is readily done, and we're preparing ourselves for a clinical trial to show that screening and treatment in pregnancy improves birth outcomes. And this potentially would be the first clinical trial in the world to show that and it could have major implications on maternal child health um, throughout Latin America and um, other countries. Chlamydia screening is routine in Europe, in the United States, and in Australia, and it's actually not based on very good data. It's based on some observational studies that women with chlamydia had worse outcomes than women without chlamydia, but no one's ever done the formal trial to, cal to make the calculations of cost effectiveness, to make the calculations of number needed to screen and treat that are necessary for big policy um, in, in today's day and age. So I'm going to move from uh, chlamydia now to uh, one of my favorite infectious diseases, syphilis. And this is a dark field. So hopefully with our new syphilis project, we will see uh, some of these. And this is... Um, the lesion seen on visual inspection, so this is not anoscopically identified lesion. So this is a visual inspection of the anus, and you can see a characteristic syphilitic chancre. It's got a smooth kind of edge to it. It doesn't have a red kind of beefy base, kind of a non-inflammatory base. And the key thing is that these lesions are painless. So men or women who have these lesions don't know they have them unless a partner identifies them or unless someone's doing a good clinical uh, examination. Uh, part of the syphilis story has been the issue of um, azithromycin resistance and again using molecular methods. So the theme here is how, is how to use molecular methods to improve public health. We were able to identify um, the resistance pattern and then um, report on the clinical and experimental outcomes of azithromycin treatment. So it was interesting that these resistant organisms had one single point mutation in the uh, 23S ribosomal RNA, and that was sufficient to confer resistance. And that single point mutation made the organism 
resistant to azithromycin or um, erythromycin, and they were able to use this uh, tool um, um, epidemiologically, and the tool was able to easily separate the wild type, which is the normal, sensitive, susceptible organism, versus the mutant, which is the organism that is resistant to azithromycin. And then, um, this is just one example of a, of a molecular epi study where we could actually characterize the trends from the introduction of the resistant isolate to the spread and increase of resistance over time. And then th th this actually with, uh, became very interesting because around that same time in uh, 2005, there was a very large trial in Tanzania which showed that azithromycin and penicillin G, a single dose of penicillin G for the treatment of early syphilis, uh, was equally efficacious as azithromycin. So you can see that their follow-up cure rates were, uh, were, were the same, irrespective of they got treated with azithromycin and, and, and penicillin. And th this was very exciting, because this meant an oral drug could potentially be used to eliminate syphilis. Um, however, because we're finding these resistant failures, um, we want to do a, a clinical trial and see if people with these resistant isolates were actually more likely to clinically fail, and we're able to show very uh, early on that two out of 12 patients who got azithro fail versus none out of the penicillin um, G patients, treated patients, and the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, stopped the study early, and that ultimately resulted in the CDC recommending against the use of azithromycin in syphilis um, as early as 2006 and repeated again in 2010. And azithromycin is not widely used unless you can prove that your um, isolates are susceptible and you don't have resistance. And this is something we like to do in uh, Peru, and hopefully with our new syphilis study, we're able to uh, do that. So as I speak about our new syphilis study a little bit, this is going to look at how we translate technology, such as um, the, the, the use of mobile phones for um, recruitment and retention, the, the, the use of the laboratory and molecular methods to um, monitor infection, the use of cytokines and new kind of um, immunologic measures to look at host response, to actually examine this triangle of, of infection. And this is kind of the classic infectious disease triangle when we think about you know, how infections affect the population, how infections affect individuals. It's related to the pathogen. So different organisms can have different virulence, they have different characteristics in terms of their infectiousness, their duration of infection, how sick they make people. But there's the environment, and in this setting we're thinking about people's sexual behavior, their venues, their sexual networks, their use of other substances, in particular alcohol. And, and the host in terms of the host's um, immune system. And those three factors come together, and that's what supports uh, continued epidemics and the effect on the, uh, effect on the population. So that, that's one of the reasons I'm here this week, is to help launch this uh, new five-year study. So as I was saying about syphilis, I didn't want to uh, neglect uh, a short discussion on the global elimination of congenital syphilis. This has been going on since um, 1999, and now it's really picked up speed at WHO, and the Gates Foundation has uh, finally demonstrated uh, some commitment to the elimination effort, and um, targets have been set globally by 2015 to try to screen more than 90 percent of all antenatal care attendees for syphilis, and then of those who are positive, treat above 90 percent. The problem is most countries um, outside of PAHO, PAHO has been very strong on this initiative, but outside of PAHO have not, um, that does not, do not have good monitoring indicators, so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to know how, how far we go. And the, the burden of disease of congenital syphilis, uh, Carlos and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday, why Uruguay, which is a relatively small, fairly developed uh, country, has a high burden of maternal syphilis. Honduras, but those are the two hot spots in, uh, in Latin America. You can see there's a variety of countries in um, Central and uh, Southern and Eastern Africa. China, while it has a you know, modest prevalence of 0.4%, being over a billion people, is a significant uh, population. Papua New Guinea has one of the highest uh, prevalences 
along with, uh, along with Madagascar. So some of these are very large populous countries, Indonesia, uh, China, that it's definitely going to be a challenge to achieve global elimination. The WHO's pillars of elimination um, are fairly you know, typical, if you will, in terms of elimination efforts. It's around advocacy and financial and political commitment, increased quality of services, and this is you know, probably a somewhat good and enlightened uh, way to think about it. If we can improve the whole and be more holistic about it, we can improve outcomes and it's trying not to be a vertical program, um, but to have some vertical um, initiatives in terms of really focus on screening and treatment and then have strong uh, surveillance and monitoring and evaluation. And part of that, um, which we're going to be exploring here as well, is the use of this dual rapid test. So there's a new test which is on a single platform which can actually detect both HIV and syphilis in the same specimen in the same test. And that's important because 1.4 million women have HIV delivered per year, but more um, women deliver up syphilis in the world. And no one knows that. That there's more women in the world who are pregnant with syphilis than with HIV. Yet every day we think about PMTCT HIV, we don't think about PMTCT syphilis. And uh, last June, I guess, six months ago, WHO twinned the PMTCT program, which means now it includes both HIV and syphilis. So when we talk about PMTCT, we have to think both HIV and syphilis. And um, as part of the evaluation of these rapid tests, we're going to be starting to do that here. So now I want to switch to HIV. Um, because that's obviously also an STD and also of uh, high interest to everyone here in the uh, audience and just cover a couple, um, a couple of basic things and then some of the new information. So oh, uh, it's already been 10 years that we added HIV RNA screening or looking for the actual virus or the antigen to our routine antibody uh, screening algorithm. So at the time we were using a second generation HIV test which um, I'll get into a little bit more detail, but with a second generation test you can detect long-standing infection but not recent infection. So we added RNA screening to that and we got more than a 10% increase in our HIV case detection. So this was important for finding people, for finding people who got recently infected, for finding people who were recently infected to get them into treatment or, recent, or research programs, for finding people who were recently infected to help notify their partners and do the contact tracing.